Great. Well, how is everybody doing today so far? Great. 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 Good. Great. Well, good. Um, like I told the other classes, I'm just like my dog. I have ADD, which is Attention Deficit Disruptive Disobedient Disorder. So if you fall into the classification of ADD or ADHD, you're in good company. I don't care if stand up, swirl around, do whatever, so be respectful of your neighbors. Okay? Um, I'm going to try to stay on track um, with following kind of a linear progression, but if any questions happen, we might divert all those things. So um, Kelly wanted me to talk today, or at least present information um, to you, because I sit on the board of directors at Diabetes Support Services. And part of that is functioning as a research analyst to review technologies that are used not only in Western healthcare, but from around the world, and to really separate the wheat from the chaff, so like separate the evidence-based research from all the marketing hype. And, um, and inter introduce um, you guys to some of the newer tools that we use for health management, especially within the diabetic population. Okay, is all that kind of like good in a nutshell? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so one of the breaking things that we're working with right now is uh, hydrogen gas and, and using that um, with our clinical diabetic population. And, and that has, in, in your medical training or nursing training, has anybody ever talked to you about this? No. no. Okay. All right, so I want to be very clear in that when I'm talking about hydrogen gas, I'm referring to H2, not H+. H+, is really acidic, don't drink that bad, okay? <laughs> H2 is, is two hydrogen atoms with extra electrons, so they can donate electrons. They're actually very, very, very unique in that hydrogen, also in hydrogen gas, also known as dihydrogen or diatomic hydrogen or molecular hydrogen, tomato, tomato, potato, potato, whichever one you decide to pick, they're all the same thing. What's very unique about it is that it can pass through, it's small enough to pass through cellular membranes, including the, the, the blood-brain barrier. So it can immediately arrest things like hydroxyl radicals, which are the most cytotoxic free radicals of all the human body. And H2 can immediately bind with that and suppress it. It immediately converts into water. Okay. So. Uh -huh. Wait, so what happens to the other like, hydrogen? I'm sorry. Is it getting too far off track? Well, per per perhaps, but right now what we know is that the hydrogen gas immediately binds with the hydroxyl and then you just get water out of it. So. I mean, that's, that's what the science says thus far. And there's no negative effect, or there's no cytotoxicity at all. And, and that was also fortunately based on 30 years of military research where they used it for super deep sea diving, where they had Navy divers breathing a very specialized exotic gas mixture called Hydro-LEX, which was 49% hydrogen, 50% helium, and 1% oxygen. And they would breathe that down to like 600 to 1,000 feet. Something crazy. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, what they realized was that there was you know, little to no cytotoxicity from that at all, even at those very high concentrations. So um, with that said, there was an interesting phenomenon that, that transpired in the early 1990s in Nordnau, Germany. And uh, there was a slate mine that's in that location in Germany. It, it, was, it was a slate mine during World War II, and it had since been converted into this special resort. And, uh, there were a large number of individuals that were suffering from terminal illnesses that went there for their last hurrah. And coincidentally, many of them had spontaneous remissions from their diseases while they were there. And it was enough to where local medical professionals got wind of this and were really curious. And so they went to investigate. And indeed, they did document that a large number of people did encounter spontaneous remissions and they didn't know how it was happening. Long story short, I'm not, I'm not sure how it really transpired, but they were able to enroll um, some Japanese uh, physicists and scientists who were able to travel to Germany to perform quantitative analysis on the area, including the cave and the water. It just so happens that the slate mine itself had been converted into a, a large wine cellar. It was this large cave, but it had a stream running through it, a natural stream, natural aquifer. And, um, the Japanese scientists discovered that there was a large quantity of hydrogen gas that was being evolved from the cave. And this was coming out of solution that was in the water. So the water was rich in hydrogen gas, which it stays in solution for a period of time. And then it immediately starts going through standard kinetics, and after 24 hours, it's kind of out of you know the water, and after 48 hours, or at 24 hours, it's at half-life, and then 40 hours, it's, it's out, and it's floating around in the environment. So these people that were going to this wine cellar or this area of, of the resort were not only respirating hydrogen gas, they were also drinking the, what they wow. called therapeutic water. And 
that was coined the Norden Howe phenomenon. Was yeah. So they, the, the physicians, encountering this, did a follow-up study on 411 diabetic patients, and what they discovered during this study was that after six days of consuming this water, biomarkers started changing measurably. LDL cholesterol was dropped by about 15%, HDL cholesterol was elevated by 7 to 8%. They encountered significant increases in insulin sensitivity. And in some cases, they had complete reversal of metabolic syndrome and diabetes type 2. And that was consuming between 1 and 2 liters per day, which is the equivalent of between 4 and 8 glasses in American terms. Okay, so that's, that's where I came to this from the diabetic side. Now, why I started investigating this is because I started investigating the Japanese healthcare system. We started noticing with our diabetic population in the United States that quality of life wasn't what we thought it should be in their later years. In Western medicine, generally speaking, diabetes is handled to some extent through dietary control, to some extent through physical fitness, but to a large extent synthetic pharmaceutical medications. The problem with this approach in the long term, and, and I, I don't want to harp on Western medicine too bad because we're great at what we do, which is emergency management. We're great. I mean, if you get like an arm lopped off, this is the place to be if you want to put it back on, right? But when it comes to long-term care, the numbers don't lie. We're 49th in the world as far as longevity, and I think over the past like month, the first day infant mortality rate for all industrialized nations, we were number one. I mean, we, we have like the highest death rate for first day infants of any industrialized nation on the planet. And that was, that was research that just broke over the, like, the last month or two. Yeah, so when, when it comes to long-term health in the United States, these are, these are numbers that we really have to take a look at. Um, same thing with diabetics, synthetic pharmaceutical medications. They're at much higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease and cancer as a result of chronic inflammation and free radical damage. Right, so as they progress in life, frequently they're on more antibiotics to stave off infections because they have a lack of blood flow to their lower extremities, which then puts them at more risk for diabetic ulceration um, and then inflammation. Um, so they're on lots of medications. After 30 to 50 years, then their kidneys take all they can handle, then they end up with tubular necrosis and they end up with hemodialysis. And then life really sucks. And then you have to ask yourself, what's the point, right? So especially once they start encountering amputations, that's, that's a total life changer, that's a game changer, right, in a bad way. So my, my job at DSS, Diabetes Support Services, was to look at all the available evidence, separate the evidence-based research from the marketing hype, and figure out how could we best serve our patients. What else was available that we weren't using? Is, it how, is this how it has to be done, or is this just the way that Western medicine does it? And technically that's what we encountered, which was this is the way Western medicine does it. Is that really because it's towards optimal health, or are there other underlying issues involved, including both business and politics? Well, the answer is yes. And I'm not going to go into those today. But what I had to look at was, well, what other options are available? And then we started looking at the Japanese system, which was very unique. It's also important to note that the Japanese have the highest life expectancies of any country in the world. They also have one of the lowest infant mortality rates of any nation in the world. They were number one for years. I think it's only been like the past five or six where they've dropped to number three. But they've also been nuked three times, they smoke like steel factories. So even so, they're still doing pretty good, right? You know, uh, pound for pound. Um, what's very unique about their medical system, though, is in the 1950s, they implemented something called Ninjin Doku, which roughly translated means human dry dock. And after World War II, they were dealing with a devastated medical system, shortages of pharmaceutical supplies, um, loss, large loss of life. Those that were still alive, they were still dealing with radiation, damage, starvation, um, malnutrition, um, a litany of issues. And to make matters worse, policymakers in the United States really muscled in wanting to psychologically cripple the Japanese culture because they knew that they were very proud and determined people. And if they didn't really crush them, they might come back. That was, that was the philosophy of the time. So the Japanese that were left, especially the policymakers, really did genuinely believe that they might be susceptible to ethnic annihilation. And so to preserve their numbers, they implemented a process called Ninjin Doku, which was 
turned out to be, as it progressed, the most progressive and results-oriented disease prevention healthcare system ever established. And over the past 50 years, those numbers bear themselves out. They now have the longest life expectancies of any nation on the planet. And what they did starting in the 1950s was they mandated that every single important policymaker, engineer, CEO, um, contributed to the community, had to go into a hospital two weeks out of every year. It was like, it was like a motel stay, where they stayed there and they were scrutinized from top to bottom to head off any illnesses. Okay. And out of that, they started developing other methodologies for disease management. And as far back as 1965, they began using electrolyzed reduced water, which is rich in hydrogen gas, although they didn't understand the chemical kinetics at the time. They just knew that it worked against acid indigestion, dyspepsia, chronic diarrhea. And it was, it's kind of, they're Tylenol, right? I mean, or, or aspirin. You know, if we had aspirin produced today, it would be heavily regulated. But because it's been around for 80 years or longer, you know, you just buy it over the counter. Very similar. So it wasn't until the Nordenau phenomenon that they really realized there was a component of this that could really be used for the diabetic population. And that's how I started discovering all this research. Okay. And it's also interesting to note that if you start going through PubMed and you start looking at all these articles, almost none of them are done in the United States. They're all in foreign countries. So the Nordenau phenomenon discovered that hydrogen gas alone, just routine consumption, um, could significantly change biomarkers for the better of the diabetic population. Then we have additional studies, which this one's double blind placebo controlled diabetes type 2, demonstrating the same concept using synthetically produced hydrogen from electrolysis. We can produce hydrogen gas in one of two ways. We can either do it through hydrolysis, so we could drop magnesium in water, and, and that can off-gas hydrogen. But that's really difficult to control, right? There's no way to really shut it off or modulate it except just removing the magnesium from water. But if we use basic electrolysis, electricity through water, what happens? What's water? H2O, right? So if, if you run electricity, it breaks it apart, right? And, and what do you get? Hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen and oxygen, okay. So if you do it really rigorously, then you completely gasify the water and you end up with you know, two big balls of gas, which are really explosive and really dangerous. Yeah. Okay, if, 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 if you do it, that's why they use it for fuel and rockets and stuff of that nature. It works great because the byproduct is water, right? It's, it's like, if you could run that in cars, it'd be great too. Um, so if you run weak electrolysis, you can actually stabilize for a period of time the gas in solution. So you can stabilize the hydrogen gas in solution for up to 24 hours. It, you'll still have a little bit of bleed off. So we know for the first four hours, it stays at maximum concentration. And then over the next 48 hours, then it begins to bleed off until after 48 hours, it's pretty much back to equilibrium. Same thing with we can embed um, oxygen gas um, in, in water to create a low level antimicrobial. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Um, but I think um, Kellyanne wanted me to share this information with you um, in large part because she wanted me to open your minds to alternative technologies that, that perhaps are not being shared in, in your training. Um, and then there's another component. Not only do we have to worry about the long-term ramifications, the negative ramifications of the routine consumption of synthetic pharmaceutical medications on our physiology, but we have to think about the environmental impact as well. Right. So when we start looking at what's happening 50 years after Western medicine um, went uh, gung-ho on antibiotics and all kinds of pharmaceutical medications and after we deregulated uh, the marketing process and now we have direct-to-consumer marketing for uh, prescription medications. We're now detecting residues from all kinds of prescription medications in our watersheds and in our, in our water supplies, including significant amounts of antibiotic resistance. Okay, now the problem with this is that the municipal water treatment plants that were designed 50 and 60 years ago were never designed to filter out these residues. So they're trickling through and up to 93% of them still make it through the system and they end up in our river streams and in our drinking water. And there's currently no scientific way to understand how all 2,000 plus of these chemicals, residues, are gonna interact and cause an impact on our long-term health, the health of wildlife, our children, sometimes they're one and the same, and, and, then, <laughs> and, then, and then the environment itself, right? So this is becoming a real problem, same thing with antibiotic resistance. Right now, as of last month, the same time we were getting our negative numbers for infant mortality rates in the United States, 
Um, the chief medical officer in Great Britain indicated that antibiotic resistance in Great Britain has become such an issue, it's now an issue of national security. And they're not even dealing with MRSA anymore, now they're dealing with CRE. And CRE is the nasty redheaded stepchild to MRSA. MRSA is bad, CRE is horrific. And there's no way to really treat it. So these are things that we really have to start thinking about with regard to how do we, as we proceed with not only Western healthcare, but just healthcare around the world, how do we proceed in a way which really produces positive results in ways that cost very little and respect our communities and the environment? And that's not necessarily an easy challenge, especially when there are politics and business models in the way. You know, from, from a scientific standpoint, it's really not that difficult sometimes. It's all the middlemen that oftentimes add complexity to it. Pardon me while I, I've been jibber jabbering. While I, while I get a drink of water, I know I've been dominating the conversation. Do you have any questions? Effective for type 2 diabetes? Not at all. It, um, it will not change the insulin production or lack of insulin production in type 1s. What type 1s wrestle with in their long term, in the progression of their disease, is collateral damage to all their other organ systems. They don't die from diabetes. They die from cardiovascular disease, cancer, and everything else that's caused by significant amounts of free radical damage, kidney failure, liver damage. Um, so hydrogen gas significantly suppresses free radical damage and therefore preserves significant amounts of, of their tissue and it retards the progression of their disease. So even in the case of someone who is frequently compromised, um, instead of drinking maybe, you know, like, a, like a, a glass, you know, every three or four hours, you just give them a little whiskey shot every single hour. You know, so they're consuming between one and two liters per day, but they're doing it on a routine basis. So they're not having, their bodies and having to wrestle with a large influx of liquid. They can just get a little shot routinely, and it makes it easier to manage. On the other study, it said their average stay there was for six days. So were the, the results that they saw, did they last for a long time? On, on that study, I don't recall, but I know my recollection is that within six days, that's when they started seeing the biomarkers change. Between like two and three days, they didn't see that many changes. On the subsequent studies, they were done um, in genuine clinical settings, because it was they couldn't do a double blind in the cave. There were too many other factors involved. But in the double blind, such as this one, uh, that was done over a period of 90 days. And the benefits um, were only had as long as the water was being consumed. So it's one of those things where you have to keep doing it. But the good thing is that it's not just for diabetics. I mean, this across the board, when you look at the epidemics that are occurring in the United States and around the world right now, almost all of them have the underlying condition of chronic inflammation and free radical damage. And if there's a way to arrest that cost-effectively and non-toxically, we can significantly arrest the progression of numerous diseases throughout the world. Would you recommend it to a healthy person? So, yeah, sure. Well, with that, I mean, is there any risk of, of uh, decreasing the inflammation process too much with this? You know, is there? Not based on current evidence. And that's in large part because hydrogen moves to the body very quickly within within 15, after consuming water, within 15 to 30 minutes, it's already completely circulated throughout the body. And uh, it's utilized within three to four hours completely. So you have to keep consuming it. And the hydrogen gas is different from other antioxidants, such as carotenoids and uh, polyphenols, um, like from green tea, or uh, carotenoids from carrots, lycopene from tomatoes. Those are big molecules. And you know, what, what berries? Go, the goji berries. The, the goji berries. Yeah. Most of those molecules have a lot of electrons that they can donate, but they're big, and they can't fit through cellular membranes. Hydrogen can because it's so small. So it's very short-lived. It doesn't have like hang time like the other molecules do. Um, because they'll float around in tissue like carotenoids will float around for weeks, you know, and once they bump into a free radical, you know, they can donate an electron and they've got some extra ones to, to donate. Hydrogen doesn't, so it's kind of a one-hit wonder. Uh, but as long as you keep it coming in, it'll keep doing its job. And um, so you can respirate it too, but that's significantly more challenging because now you've got hydrogen floating around in the air and anything above 4% atmospheric concentration, again, is an explosion hazard. So the safest and most effective way of taking it in is simply enriching water with it drinking it. And again, the safest and most effective way is through a medically certified electrolyte water generator. So, and, um, and what's, did Kellyanne give you any, any of the documents that I sent two, three months ago? Do, do you have a case study that you're working on? I like that. I, I vaguely recall like a female that was like 50 plus ovarian cancer, diabetes yes. type two. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so um, I want to kind of stay on track with that and not diverge. So I told you I've got the ADDDDD7. I'll just talk for hours about all kinds of stuff. So um, instead, on track with that case study, she has ovarian cancer, right? Is, is that what it was? Yes. yes. Okay. And do, do we know if she's undergoing radiotherapy or chemotherapy? No. She just had a hysterectomy, but we don't know so, what's going to happen now. Okay, so we don't know what kind of therapy she's, yeah. she's going to. Okay. All right, so she's just out of surgery. Okay, so we know now how hydrogen can be applied to a diabetic population, and perhaps, depending on her position, how it could be applied to, to her, right? Depending on if she's in Japan or the United States. It all kind of varies, right? In Japan, they'd be really open to the United States. They'd have to go through a lot of clinical documentation, which is the same stuff I'm presenting to you today. Okay, so with regard to... Um, Tumor treatment, cancer treatment in the United States, that's a hot potato, and for a bunch of different reasons. But this information I'm gonna share with you today, I want you to be open to, um, because you're kind of the front line when it comes to healthcare. Physicians are well-meaning, but oftentimes they're very myopic, and you guys deal with the real stuff, and have a lot more common sense in my experience, because you have your feet on the street every single day. Um, so when it really boils down to it, you guys are really going to be the ones guiding the physicians. The physicians go off to the little seminars and stuff and learn about what is supposed to be cutting edge, but generally that's because pharmaceutical companies want to talk that way, not necessarily what actually works the best for optimal health over the community. So um, with regard to hydrogen gas, the Air Force Colonel, I think his name was uh, William Paul Pfeiffer, Paul William Pfeiffer, um, he was the Air Force Colonel who was in charge of hyperbaric oxygen uh, therapy and development in the 60s. Um, they, the Air Force started heavily investing, investigating hyperbaric oxygen following the high altitude um, secret surveillance flights from the U-2 because that was the first time pilots were really flying at super high altitudes breathing 100% oxygen and they weren't sure what the effects were going to be on, on the human body. And so they had to learn about things like hyperoxia and uh, lung burns and or aging and all that stuff. Um, he moved on from that to work with the Navy and Sea Lab, which was an, an underwater laboratory, um, where he then studied um, breathing gases such as hydrolex, which is 49% hydrogen, 50% helium, 1% oxygen. And um, then he went on to study hyperbaric hydrogen. And that's kind of dangerous stuff, because now you have a highly pressurized environment with hydrogen gas, and um, that can be very explosive. But there was a hunch in 1967 that because cancer is highly associated with free radical damage, which causes DNA denaturing, that if there was a way to arrest the free radical damage, that we could effectively stall or significantly suppress the development of cancer. So that was a hypothesis in 1967. And then they did an animal study in 1975 using lab rats and intentionally infecting them with squamous cell carcinoma, which is skin cancer. And what they discovered was that when they were exposed to 97.5% hydrogen, I think like 2.5% oxygen in the atmosphere, um, within two weeks, all of those uh, cancerous lesions had completely resolved. Okay, now what's interesting to note is that following that research, continuous research in the United States went black on that topic. No other research was done. Okay, I don't have the answer to that. In looking at all the research, there's no, there's no logical way to justify why that was done. There's certainly conspiracy theory, there's politics, there's business, all those play into it, no doubt. But there's no logical reason why it should have been stopped. From that point forward, all additional information or all additional research regarding that topic had to be done outside the United States. And that's where the Japanese started doing their research. And again, the Japanese have a medical system that's geared towards genuine disease prevention, and they do that because they were genuinely concerned about ethnic preservation. That's different from the way the Western medical healthcare system works, which never had to undergo that process. Our medical system was never based on cultural or ethnic preservation. It was based on a business model uh, that was developed in the early 1900s, and it's continued to this day. So that, those are things that we have to think about. What I have to think about when I'm doing my research is, you know, do we, is Western medicine doing this because it's truly effective or more effective than other options, or is it because that's the way that clinics can easily build for it? And is it easily buildable that way because of policies that have been put in place, and why were those policies put there? Okay, so in 1975, this was a study that was done by Dr. Fife. You can find this also through, I think it's available on PubMed, it might have been on a different database. What I've realized is that a lot of the, a lot of the oncology research isn't necessarily replicated. Um, 
PubMed replicates almost all research unless it's oncology. It's interesting. I think there's political issues involved in that too. So just food for thought. In 1999, Japanese researchers started figuring out some of the mechanisms of action with regard to hydrogen-rich water on tumor cells. And the hydrogen, which is contained in electrolyzed reduced water, that's why it's called reduced, um, has an effect on telomeres on tumor DNA. Telomeres are little end caps which allow DNA to replicate. And as long as the telomeres are long, they can continue replicate. They don't know exactly why it does this, but they know that electrolyzed reduced water, which is rich in hydrogen gas, suppresses telomeres on tumor cells, thereby retarding the development of the tumor. Only tumor cells, or? It's, it appears to be selective. Okay. Not in healthy cells, only in tumor cells. They don't, they don't understand why. That just it appears to be selective. Okay. Now also, it's important to recognize that radiation exposure causes hydroxyl radicals, which are the most cytotoxic free radicals in the human body. When a hydroxyl radical experiences or connects with hydrogen gas, what's the byproduct? Water. Water. H2O. Okay. So technically speaking, in Japan right now, they're investigating the routine consumption of electrolyzed reduced water as a countermeasure against nuclear radiation exposure following the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster. Because it's cost effective. Perhaps one of the reasons why it's not more utilized in the United States is that it's a natural substance and it's not patentable. And therefore it cannot be highly controlled. It cannot be, the, the creation of it can't be artificially suppressed and therefore the price cannot be artificially inflated. It's curious to note that chemotherapy drugs in the United States often carry a 1,000% markup compared to their sale in foreign countries. Why is that? Well, when you talk to the pharmaceutical companies, they scratch their heads and they can't figure it out. That's not technically true. They just don't want to tell you what the reason is. When they're called to Capitol Hill, also, they scratch their heads and claim they can't figure it out. But they're patentable and controllable, right? And if they need to increase their profit margins, they simply restrict supply. Does anybody know what the cost of, of cancer is, like on average, in the United States? Too much. Really. So, I mean, for instance, if, if you're diagnosed with cancer, on, on average, on, on average, the cost to an American citizen, if you're diagnosed, regardless of the kind, you'll be dead within three to five years, and the cost of your care will be $350,000 plus. Those are the stats. One in three of us will be diabetic by the year 2050 if we proceed with the direction that we're going. One in two of us will have cancer. And we'll certainly all have cardiovascular disease if we keep using the same system that we're using. Okay, so it's important for us, especially you guys coming into the field, to, it's important for me to share this information with you, not for the sake of beating down pharmaceutical companies, not for the sake of criticizing physicians, but to open your minds to other options. Because when you're out there wrestling in the field, you're only as good as the tools that you know about. And if you know about other options, that's going to make you a much better healthcare practitioner. Okay? So if our potential case study undergoes radiotherapy for ovarian cancer, was it ovarian or uterine? It's ovarian. It's ovarian. Okay. Fortunately, we, we did have a Japanese physician here in the United States. Uh, working at the uh, University of Pittsburgh, uh, who's also a surgeon, and he's been very progressive with regard to research being done stateside. Again, note, he's Japanese, okay? And uh, this was one of the more recent research articles regarding the use of hydrogen-rich water to suppress damage caused by uh, radiotherapy. So in essence, what the article says is that if the patient is routinely consuming water enriched with hydrogen gas, um, then it will help to protect all of the other organs against any collateral damage caused by the, by the radiotherapy. Okay, which is often the case because once they're being treated, there are other organs that are, that are affected by the radiation. Okay, same thing for um, uh, cisplatinum-induced nephrotoxicity. Cisplatinum, a uh, very powerful chemotherapy drug. Oftentimes it causes kidney failure, kidney damage. 
hydrogen gas significantly suppresses the damage. Okay. As you'll note, all this research, almost all of it is done in Japan. What are the barriers to access to this? At a, at a, we use medically certified electrically required generators at the university level. And those basically, it's an electrolysis machine that's been certified by the medical system in Japan, um, the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare. Uh, and they've been doing that since 1965. We can also use the same technology to produce water that's rich in oxygen gas. And if we use saline solution instead of water, then we can actually produce a very powerful disinfectant. We can actually produce um, water that is rich, did I, did I, it's, um, here it is. Uh, we can produce an aqueous solution that's rich in about 17 uh, ppm O2 and about 35 ppm free chlorine. That's technically called hypochlorous acid. And that is not to be confused with hydrochloric acid, okay? Hydrochloric acid will burn your face off. Hypochlorous acid might dry your skin out, okay? Hypochlorous acid is actually the same natural biocide that's in our white blood cells. Again, not patentable. However, what we do know is that we can produce it from basic salt and electricity. How does your body produce it? Basic salt and electricity. We just do it on a bigger scale. Okay, what's important to note about this is that it's completely biodegradable. Once it goes in the septic system, 12 hours, it's completely inert. Okay. We can suppress MERS in 30 seconds or less using this topically. Yeah. So when we start thinking about antibiotic resistance and using all kinds of other synthetic pharmaceutical medications, which are done because they're patentable, controllable, and marketed, and they can, prices can be inflated, then we have something that is not patentable and not really that controllable, and uh, it is completely biodegradable and very effective against, it's kind of a no-brainer, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so then you run into my problem, which is, I've got big pharma on this side, and I've got yeah. snake oil salesmen on this side, and I'm just trying to shoot down the middle and share the evidence-based research and separate that from all the crazy wild things that are being said over here, which are marketing hype, and then the political agendas over here, you know, which want to drive in a different direction for increased profit margins. Okay? Now, in the case of hypochlorous acid, this is also very important for diabetic patients because they're much more susceptible to lack of blood flow to the lower extremities development of diabetic ulcers, and um, then if infection sets in, then potential amputation. So the general course in the United States is antibiotics to suppress bacterial load and then you know, some type of topical wound treatment to help with closure, if it happens. So um, we can also use hypochlorous acid topically you know, in a medical environment. It helps when we have a surgeon on board to be able to direct it, although it is not toxic. That's done more for politics than it is for efficacy. Okay. This article was written 2011, 2012 actually. I think it was 2011, it was published in 2012. It's called Electrochemically Activated Solutions. So that's, that's currently the lingo that we use in the clinical environment for hypochlorous acid or any electrochemically produced solution that we can use as a topical disinfectant or uh, uh, like a solvent. Now, whoever wrote this is probably really proud. They're like, wow, I'm gonna, gonna get my PhD. I'm gonna get a job now. And they thought they were on something new. No, they weren't on anything new. This was used in, 19, in 1915, in World <laughs> War I, okay? World War I, they used it on hospital ships, okay? It was actually developed in 1889 as a means of sewage disinfection in London because they could use seawater, they could run electricity through seawater, they could produce dilute, uh, they could produce a water that had dilute chlorine in it, which they could then, then use to disinfect sewage with. That's how it was initially designed. Then in World War I, it was applied to British and French hospital ships, which were military vessels, because they had mature electrical systems. Most, most municipalities did not. So even if you wanted to use this technology for sewage disinfection, it still was big, it was bulky, it was the size of this room, and it required a customized electrical system, which nobody really had at the time. But the military, always being ahead of the game, had sophisticated electrical systems on their ships. So they built electrolyzers out of cedar wood carbon electrodes. And they dumped seawater in there because what's seawater? 
dirty saving it's dirty saline solution is what it is. You already got your your, your sodium chloride in there. So then they electrolyze that and now they add an aqueous solution that was rich in, high, in, in oxygen gas and free chlorine, which they then use to clean the decks, wash the laundry, and treat surgical infections. Or treats, you know, surgical. Two minutes? Two minutes. Wow, we've got to wrap this up really quickly. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and then the hydrogen rich water, which is produced in the process, they just chucked overboard because of the time it was worthless. Okay, they didn't discover it actually had benefits until the Japanese began investigating in the 1930s, began investigating plants and animals. Um, and then after World War II, because they had no pharmaceutical medications, their healthcare system was completely destroyed following World War II. They were open to other things, which is the same thing I'm trying to do with you guys, which is open your eyes to other things, and, um, and then they're much better off for it because now they have the longest life expectancies in the nation of the world. Okay, so with that said, we can use the same technology on diabetic ulceration. We had a 71-year-old case study last summer where we had a 71-year-old diabetic who developed an ulceration on the medial side of his right leg just above the ankle. Um, it initially started about this big, the end of a little pin. Within four days, it was that long, about an inch and a half wide. Went to the oncologist, and the oncologist uh, basically said, look, 71 years old, you have significant cardiovascular disease, significant neuropathy, you know, I'd like to be able to tell you good things, but here's the reality, you're probably looking at an amputation. Now, there's some things that I can't say because we're on video right now, which I said in other classes, so I'll, you'll have to ask him what I said. Um, but ultimately, his wife shared with me some things that I also can't share on, on the video. But, uh, but she was aware of the research that was happening at the university, and um, long story short, um, hypochlorous acid, technically called electrolytic sodium hypochlorite, was placed in the container. He spritzed it every four hours. Within three days, he had complete scab over. Within three weeks, he had 75% wound resolution. Within six weeks, it was completely healed with only a scar. With no use of, with no need for antibiotics whatsoever. Okay, so again, there's another way of reducing the dependency on antibiotics, thereby reducing our risk of being exposed to antibiotic resistance and then environmental factors involved in that too. Okay. What kind of spectrum does the hypochlorous acid work on as far as antibiotics? Like gram negative, gram positive, everything in between? That's, that, that's a really good question, and I've got documentation um, that covers that, and I don't have it right on the tip of my tongue, but if you contact me via email, I can get it to you. Okay. Um, what we do know, just what I remember right off the cuff, MRSA, Clepsi pneumonia, Salmonella, E. coli, Staphylococcus, and over 40 other pathogens that have been tested on, including fungi, bacteria, and viruses. That's what I remember right off the cuff. Um, you know, and th would this be... Could this be ingestible as well? Generally not. It's generally topical only. Okay. Yeah, and that's because it's very oxidizing. So the good thing though is that even if you did do it, it's not going to have any dire consequences. Like if your child took a shot glass of electrolytic sodium hypochlorite, they might feel like awkward, but they're not going to die. If they took a shot of straight bleach, they would be in the emergency room probably dead. Okay, so when we're looking at safety, there's really no options. So the way that we can implement this into our clinical practice is by educating our patients. And if you can also influence your physicians, because here's the deal. Most of them are so time-strapped, they don't have the time to review stuff like this. That's why I'm trying, that's why Kelly has me here today, to work with you guys, so you guys are aware of it. Because you will end up influencing them. You know, somebody like myself, they might take the time to listen, they might not. The fact that I, I'm an executive on a board for a community health organization, it helps, but that's certainly no shoe in. And just because I drop clinical evidence on the table doesn't mean they're going to be open to it, right? Or understand it. Or understand it. You know, and, and I, I really have to stick a fork in my eye sometimes because I'm appalled at what some physicians don't understand. And I, I, do, I do know that they're time strapped, um, but it's frightening sometimes. It really is. And so, I could spend a lot of time complaining about that, or I could spend my time educating. And I, I try to choose a lot. Doesn't mean I don't complain sometimes, but I, I try to focus on the other side. That's what actually gets the job done.